Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look at the 2018 Advanced Hire Multiple Choice section. If you haven't already tried this, pause the video now, go to the SQA website and give this part of the paper a go. You can then use this video to help you mark it. The idea behind this video is that it will show you how to get to the answers, not just the answers themselves, which is what you will find in the mark scheme. These questions go roughly in order of the course. So question one is looking at one of the first topics you would have covered, which is the electromagnetic spectrum. You are expected to know the order of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the order is gamma rays, x-ray, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. So looking at the answers here, we have gamma rays, infrared, and ultraviolet. So the one which is not a form of electromagnetic radiation is A, beta. This is a particle which is released during radioactive decay. Question two, we have a diagram to show an outline of the periodic table. The periodic table is split into four different areas. So we have an area here in red, an area in the middle here, which I'm putting in yellow, an area over at this side, which I'm having in green, and the part that we're looking at, which is in blue. These are given blocks, which are based on the last shell that an electron enters when you fill up the ele electronic configuration. So for this block over here, the last shell to have any electrons is the S part. The part in the middle is the D block. Over at the right hand side is the P block. And at the bottom, we have the F block. So our answer here is D. Here we have a picture of a D orbital and we want to know the maximum number of electrons that can occupy this orbital. So any orbital can only hold two electrons. This orbital has four parts to it, but it can only hold two electrons. This orbital is the dx squared minus y squared, as it is on the axes here. For the reaction BF3 plus F minus to become BF4 minus, what is the three-dimensional arrangement of bonds? So here you have to use the VSEPR rules. So looking first at BF3, boron has three electrons in its outer shell and we are adding three atoms to that. We have no charge. So overall, there are six electrons. If we divide by two to get electron pairs, we have three. And if we take off the three, which are not uh, three atoms which are attached, we find we have no lone pairs. This means that we start in a trigonal planar arrangement of bonds. So we can eliminate A and B. If we look at BF4 minus, we have three electrons. We have four things that we're attaching and we're going to add one for the negative charge. So overall we have eight. If we divide that by two to get electron pairs, we have four. There are four things attached, so we have no lone pairs. This means that we end up in a tetrahedral arrangement. So D is our answer. Question five, we're looking at the arrangement for the three D electrons in the nickel two plus ion within this complex. So first of all, if we write out the electron configuration for nickel, so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d8, 4s2. When we turn this into a nickel 2 plus ion, we remove the 4s electrons and we're just going to concentrate now on the 8d electrons. Since this is a complex, the d orbitals are no longer degenerate and will have split, so we can ignore c and d as the answers. We have eight electrons, so when they fill, they're going to fill in the arrangement of b. 
Question six, manganese has an oxidation number of plus five in which of these? So if we take each in turn, so we have MnO4 minus, so oxygen has an oxidation number of negative two, and we have four of those. So we have negative eight. Overall, we have a charge of one minus, so the manganese must be plus seven. we look at the next one we have MnO4 2 minus so again we have the minus 8 for the oxygen we need to get to minus 2 so the manganese must be plus 6 in the next one we have MnO4 3 minus so we have 8 minus for the oxygen and we need to get to 3 minus so we have 5 plus for the manganese and if we just look at the final one, we have 4 minus for the oxygen and no charge overall, so 4 plus for the manganese. So C is our answer. Question 7. When sulfur dioxide and oxygen react, the following equilibrium is established. Which line in the table is correct if the temperature of the equilibrium is increased? So the key here to look at is the enthalpy change which is negative so this is an exothermic reaction and therefore gives out heat if you have an exothermic reaction and you increase the temperature then you're going to shift the equilibrium to the left by shifting this to the left means that your products will decrease and in this case SO3 is your product if your products decrease then that means that your value of K will also decrease. So A is the answer. Question eight, which line in the table correctly describes H2CO3 and HCN? So here we're looking for acid base and conjugate acid base pairs. So if we start by looking at H2CO3, if we look at the right hand side, we can see that this becomes HCO3 minus. So we've lost one of the H atoms here, which means that that is donating, um, donating an H plus, which means that it's acting as an acid. So this means that we can ignore A and B as answers. If we now have a look at the HCN on the right hand side, and if we look at what it was before, it was CN minus. So CN minus accepted the H plus, so was acting as the base, which means that HCN minus is the conjugate acid in that pair. So our answer here is D. Question nine, what is the concentration of hydroxide ions in a solution with a pH of 8.5? There are a couple of ways that you can calculate um, the concentration of hydroxide ions. The simplest way is to use the relationship of pH plus pOH, which equals 14. This means we can work out pOH by doing 14 minus 8.5 to give us a pOH of 5.5. We then have a second relationship we can use. So pOH is the negative log of the concentration of OH minus ions. And we can rearrange this to be 10 to the power of the negative pOH. So if we work this through, then we get 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6, which is B. Question 10. Butanoic acid is a weak acid which, which dissociates as shown below when it's in water and we're looking at how we can shift the equilibrium to the right. So there are different ways that we can shift the equilibrium to the right. You could add in reactants, you could remove products, or you could change the temperature. So here, if we have a look at each option, so adding a catalyst will not shift the equilibrium to the right, we'll just get to the equilibrium quicker. If we add sulfuric acid, what we're actually adding in there is H+ which is on the right hand side, so this would shift the equilibrium to the left. If we add sodium hydroxide, we're adding an OH minus, 
that would react with the H plus ions and remove them from the equation. Therefore, the equilibrium would have to shift to the right to rebalance that. So C would be our answer. If you were to add sodium butanoate, you'd be putting in the butanoate ions, which you find on the right hand side, and that would also shift the equilibrium to the left. Okay, which of the following salts forms an alkaline sol solution when in water? So to form an alkaline solution, you need to use a weak acid and a strong base to make your salt. So sodium sulfate would have to be made from something like sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. So that would be strong and strong. So it can't be A. Lithium chloride would also have been made from something like lithium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, which are both strong. Ammonium nitrate would have been made from ammonia, which is a weak base, and nitric acid, which is a strong acid. So that will be wrong. And then finally, potassium propanoate would be made from something like potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, and propanoic acid, which is a weak acid. So D is our answer. Question 12, which of the following combinations would produce a buffer solution? So you need to know the definition of a buffer solution. So buffer solutions are made from weak acids or bases plus a salt of that acid or base. So sodium chloride and ammonia, we have a weak base there. However, this is an incorrect salt. Ammonium chloride and ammonia, we have a weak base and a salt which is made from that base. So that will act as a buffer. For sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide, they are made from strong acids and bases. And one is a strong base. And then for ammonium chloride and sodium hydroxide, we have a strong base and a salt which is made from a weak base, but they don't go together as a buffer. Question 13, which of the following reactions would the value of delta G minus delta H be closest to zero? This is relying on you knowing your relationship of delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If we rearrange this, so we have delta G minus delta H as we have in the question, that equals negative t delta s. We're then going to set this to equal zero. That would imply that t delta s equals zero. Now we know that t is not going to be zero because that would be absolute zero. So this means that delta s needs to be zero. So the change in entropy. So if we look at each of the equations that we have here, so going from one solid to a solid and a gas will be an increase in entropy. Going from a solid and a gas to two gases is another increase in entropy. A solid and aqueous to aqueous and gas is an increase in entropy. And then finally, we've got aqueous and solid to aqueous and solid. So there's no change in entropy there. Therefore, this one will be the one where delta G minus delta H is closest to zero. Question 14. The following reaction is first order with respect to P and second order with respect to Q. Which of the following statements is not correct? So for A, the reaction is third order overall. So we've got first order and second order. If we add those together, we do have third order overall. The reaction occurs by a simple one-step mechanism. If we have a look at the rate equation, This tells us what our rate determining step is. So the rate determining step for this reaction is P plus 2Q to give some sort of intermediate. If we compare this to the overall reaction, we can see that we don't have 2Q in the overall reaction. If we had a simple one step mechanism, then it would go as the overall reaction is shown here. However, the rate determining step has 2Q in it. This means it cannot be a simple one-step mechanism. 
For C, the rate of reaction decreases as the reaction proceeds. This happens for all reactions as you use up the, the reactants. And for D, the rate of reaction will double if the initial concentration of P is doubled. This is how you can know if something is first order. So the answer is B. Question 15. Which of the following types of hybridization occur in the above compound? So here we have single carbon to carbon bonds and a triple bond. In a single bond, we have sp3 hybridized carbons. And in a triple bond, we have sp hybridized carbons. This means that B is the answer. Benzofuran is an important starting material in the manufacture of some medicines. You need to find the gram formula mass of benzofuran. What this is testing is your knowledge of skeletal formula and putting in where the hydrogens should be. So we have a benzene ring here. So on each of these carbons, we have a hydrogen. There's no hydrogens here and here because we already have a bond to something else. We have another hydrogen here and another one here and we can count up the carbons here have four bonds so one two three four. So this means that the formula that we have is C8 H6O and now we simply calculate gram formula mass using the data book to help if required. So C is the answer. Question 17. The diagram represents one enantiomer of an optically active compound where W, X, Y and Z are the four different groups, which the following represents the other enantiomer. So if we notice that W is being kept in the same place in all four of these structures. We can then have a look at the part at the bottom. What we're looking for is for two of these groups to have been swapped over. And when that happens, what we would find is that the order that these will appear will change. So here, if we go X, Y, Z, you can see that we're going anti-clockwise. So if we have a look now at each of these, we have X, Y, and Z now going clockwise in A, which would indicate that A is probably our answer. You can also tell because Y and Z have been swapped over. It's harder to see in the other three examples. Here we have X, Y, and Z, and we're going around anti-clockwise. Here we have X, Y, and Z, again going anti-clockwise, and X, Y, and Z going anti-clockwise. So although it's difficult to tell at first glance, B, C, D and the original structure are all the same, whereas A is different. Question 18, we're starting to look at some of the synthetic chemistry. So looking at this reagent here, this is sodium butoxide. You should have looked at the, uh, the alkoxides when looking at forming ethers and the need to make your nucleophile before you do the nucleophilic substitution reaction. To make sodium butoxide, you need to take butanol and you add sodium into it. Question 19, the above reaction is an example of what? So these are four types of reaction that you're expected to be familiar with. Hydration is where you would add water. We've not added water on here. Oxidation, is where you would increase the oxygen to hydrogen ratio. We haven't done that either. Hydrolysis is where you would split something up using water and the water would add on to the two different new molecules. And hydrogenation is where you would add hydrogen. This is a very useful reaction where you can turn a nitrile into a carboxylic acid and is an example of hydrolysis. Question 20. 18 grams of an oxide of copper contains 16 grams of copper. What is the empirical formula? So to work out empirical formula, we start with the two elements that we have. We have the mass, which is 16 grams for copper. And if we do 18 minus 16, we'll get how much oxygen we have, which is two. We're going to divide by the gram formula mass for each to get the number of moles.
Once we have the number of moles, we're going to divide by the smaller to get a ratio. And this ratio will give us the empirical formula. So here we have a ratio of 2 to 1, so Cu2O, so that gives the answer of B. Question 21. A simplified mass spectrum of an organic compound is shown below. Which of the following compounds could not have produced this spectrum? When looking at this spectrum, the key to working out which one of these could not produce this spectrum is to look at this peak here, 74. This is your molecular ion and is equivalent to your GFM. If you work out the GFM of each of these compounds, you'll find the first one is 74, the second is 74, the third is 73, and the last one is 74. So it's not possible for C to produce this mass spectrum because it only has a GFM of 73. Question 22. The infrared spectrum of eugenol would not be predicted to have an absorption in which wave number range. You can use page 14 of your data book to find the different wave number ranges. You'll find that the first one is for benzene, the second is for alkanes, the third is for aromatic esters, and the last one is for an alkyl ether. So we have a benzene ring here in the middle of the structure. We have alkane here. We have an alkyl ether here, but we have no aromatic esters. So we will not find C in the absorption spectrum. Question 23. Salbutamol is used to treat asthma. It behaves like the body's natural active compound by triggering a response in the muscles of the airway. What kind of compound is salbutamol? So if salbutamol triggers the body's natural response, then it's acting as an agonist in the body. If it was to block the response, it would be an antagonist, and the receptor is where it binds. Question 24. 200 centimetres cubed of water is added to 50 centimetres cubed of 2 molar sodium hydroxide solution. Calculate the concentration of the diluted sodium hydroxide. So for this calculation, we can do C1, V1 equals C2, V2. So our original concentration is 2. Our original volume is 0 0.05. We're trying to find the new concentration and we multiply that by the new volume, which is the 50 plus the 200. So the new concentration is 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.25, which is 0 0.4 moles per liter. Question 25. For solvent extraction from an aqueous solution, the solvent used should be immiscible with water and relatively unreactive. Which of the following would be the most suitable solvent? So the first solvent that we have is an aldehyde, which could be quite soluble in water and might be reactive. The second solvent that we have is an ether, which is usually not very soluble in water and is also very unreactive. Our next solvent is a carboxylic acid. Again, could be soluble in water and is reactive. And then finally, an alcohol, which could also be soluble in water. So your best choice would be an ether. Question 26. Which of the following is not a step in the recrystallization uh, technique? So for recrystallization, you need to dissolve your crystals in a minimum of hot solvent. Whilst it's still hot, you need to filter it to remove any insoluble impurities. And once you've done that, you let your filtrate cool down slowly. At no point do you have to test your filtrate to ensure that no more precipitate forms. So D is your answer. Question 27. The melting point of an impure substance was determined to be 111 to 114. After purification, what should happen to the melting point? So when you have impurities within a substance, you often find that your melting point is over quite a wide range and is slightly lower than you would expect it to be. So when you purify it, you should find that it's slightly higher and narrower than it was when it was impure. During the technique of heating to constant mass, the purpose of the desiccator is to do what? 
So the purpose of a desiccator is to prevent water um, absorbing into your into your solid when it's hot. It is not to remove water from the compound, and this is a very common mistake. Question 29. Using thin layer chromatography, the components of a sample can be identified using RF values. Which of the following affects the RF value for an individual component? So for A, the distance moved by the solvent, this would be the lower line of the RF value, and since it's just a ratio, this won't have an effect. The concentration of the sample will just make your spot more concentrated. The length of your TLC plate won't really make any difference, you'll just stop it sooner or later. But the type of solvent that you use will change what RF value you have, because this will change how far your spot can travel. Question 29, which of the following shows the apparatus correctly set up for heating under reflux? So for heating under reflux, you want to heat for an extended period of time whilst condensing any gases that are produced. So A and B can be ignored as they are for distillation. And now we need to look at C and D. Now the difference between these two is where the water enters and where the water leaves. The water should always go in at the bottom of the condenser and come out at the top. So C is the answer. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for regular updates on new videos. Remember to ring the bell to be notified when new videos are released and follow me on Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for flashcards. Bye for now!